Wait a minute, thank you for that, Miss Janet. How great thou art. You can't go wrong with that song. This is always a good time to sing and be reminded of how great God is. Now remember, Miss Janet said that she has candy for the children <laughs> after services today. We will be taking IDs to confirm the age of these quote-unquote children that are hounding her for candy afterwards. So before the children are dismissed downstairs, kids, I, I need you to do me a favor. I'm going to have you come back up towards the end of the message, okay? So when Miss Jess, my, Mr. Michael's gonna come downstairs, and when you come back up, just follow Miss Jess, I'm gonna have you sit right up here on the front row and come up front for the end of the message. Can you guys do that for me? Can just be really quiet? Okay, thank you for that. You guys can go ahead and be dismissed. Down to your class downstairs, the team kid, kids in discipleship. They all said that, yeah, they, they're gonna be quiet, but I guarantee my kids will not be quiet. <laughs> Three things that you can be assured of in life, death, taxes, and Ari hitting those doors like a linebacker when she comes through the church. That's a few things I've, I've already found out. So if you are uh, tuning in online, we're glad to have you joining us. If you could just uh, let us know you're watching, if you're um, tuning in with us today, if you just give us a like or a comment. If you'd also share the, the message, if it's been a blessing to you. And also, if there's anything we can do for you, if you're tuning in and joining us online, if we can pray for you about anything, if you just send us a message or email us at gbbcbath at gmail.com, we would love to uh, minister to you in any way we can, help you get plugged in and connected to uh, our small groups that we have here designed for fellowship and in discipleship here at uh, Grace Bible Baptist Church. And also, th those of you that are, have recently taken some steps of faith, those who have gotten saved recently, if, it's, if you're ready to get saved or if you're ready to get baptized, let me know. We've had a few, actually the past three weeks, I've had, we th we had somebody get saved um, in the past three weeks, which is a blessing. Um, so if you're ready to take that step of faith, that step of obedience to believer's baptism, please let us know. We'd like to um, help you uh, take that step. Um, as well. We're going to be back in Hebrews chapter 11 today, and I, I'll be honest, I'm excited. I, I am charged up. This series has been a blessing to me to pray over, to fast over, to prepare, and God is encouraging me. God is edifying me through his word. It's been a blessing for me to study out this idea, this facet, this amazingly powerful, profound truth in the Bible of what faith is and what faith does does. So I've been encouraged through this. I hope that you have been too. We're going to be back in Hebrews chapter 11 today. Our key verse is going to be in verse 7. So if you have your Bibles, if you're able to, I'd invite you to stand out of the honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to start in verse 1 and read down through verse 7. So when we get to verse 7, really kind of hone in on that verse. That's where we're going to camp our mental thoughts. That's where we're really going to dig into for today. But starting there in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by yet he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And verse 7 is our key text for today. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today just once again praising you. Father, on a day on a mark on our calendars where we think about love, Father, we are reminded that just how much you love us. Lord, you tell us in your word that you so love the world. That word so meaning awesome. So greatly, you so perfectly, completely love us. And Lord, we just want to say thank you. 
Father, we also meet in your house with a very real understanding that we have a real enemy who is against you, who is against those that love you, and is against everything that's going on here in your house today. So Father, I ask you to bind the enemy. I ask you to keep any hindrances, any doubts, any fears, any uncertainties that would creep into our hearts and to our minds that would keep us from hearing from you today, Father. I ask you to not let the enemy steal the joy of your word from our hearts today. Father, we also have the realization that some of the hindrances that we have are not from the outside. It's not from our enemy. It's from ourselves. Father, I pray that you would remove any negativity, any critical spirit, any worry, any anxiety, any stress, any fear that we've brought with us into your house today. Father, help us be reminded of your love for us today and help us to return that love to you by our hearing, our listening, our attending, and our re responding to your word today. Lord, as always, nobody needs to hear from me. But Lord, more than ever, Lord, now more than ever, we need to hear from you. So Lord, I ask you to speak to me. I ask you to speak through me. I pray that you'll change our hearts. Change our lives, Lord. Don't allow any of us to walk out of here in the same condition than what we came in. Help us to be conformed, Father, into the image of our Savior. Move to serve you more, to love you better with all of our hearts. We pray all these things in the perfect, precious, and powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. Like I mentioned, I'm excited. I am uh, charged up to pick up where we are today here in verse 7. And part of the reason why I'm so excited is because if you look at who we're talking about today in verse 7, I'm talking about Noah. Now, Noah is one of these guys who, um, in the Bible, gets those juices flowing, so to speak. Noah is a man that, when you read his name, it's synonymous with action. It's synonymous with faith. That's why he's mentioned here in this hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Noah is one of the quintessential heroes of faith in the Bible. And the reason why I get so excited about Noah is probably the same reason why you get excited about hearing about Noah. Because he's one of these guys that has the type of testimony that we want to have. Back in Genesis chapter 6, there's a lot going on in that chapter. But down in verse 9, God tells us that, that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. He says that Noah walked with God, and then in verse 8, it tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. When God looked down from heaven at the world that he had created, when God was displeased with how people in the world were living, when he was upset about the direction the world was headed, he was, disappo he was disappointed with all other men in the world, but it tells us he was pleased with Noah. When God made the conscious and intentional decision to remove mankind, he intentionally chose to start the human race over again with Noah. And we're going to look today at what we know about Noah and what we can relate to. Because the truth of the thing is, there are some things about Noah's life that we can't relate to. Be, I, look, Noah building an ark that size, I've never been asked to do that. I can't, most of you know, I can't build anything. If, if God had asked me to build an, an ark, it would have looked like a single popsicle stick would flow down the Canastillo River. That's what it looked like. But the reality is, there's some things that God asked Noah to do that we can't relate to. 
But the truth matter is there's a lot about Noah's life that we can relate to. And that's what we're going to focus in on today. We're going to look at what we know about Noah and what we can relate to. We know the story of Noah building the ark and getting mocked by the people of his day. People that thought he was crazy for building an ark in the middle of a desert where it never rained. We can relate to that a little bit. We know what it's like to be ridiculed and mocked for taking God at his word. We've had people probably laugh at us for our faith, so we can relate to that. Noah had to go down into Sodom and rescue his nephew Lot when he got into trouble down there. Some of us can relate to that. We can relate to having family and friends who, against our advice, make decisions that end up leading them into trouble, and you've had to go down there and help straighten out that whole mess. So we can relate to that a little bit. Noah had to round up animals that God had designated to be saved from the flood and lead them into the ark. Now, I've never had to lead elephants two by two to get them to walk orderly into an ark, but I've had to try to lead three kids in and out of a church in a house, which is somewhat like herding animals. So I can relate a little bit to Noah in that regard. So there's parts of Noah's life recorded for us that we can look at and say, I can get that. I can relate to that. It's not the same, but I can get, I can get where Noah's coming from. I can, deal, I can get his struggle a little bit. Now, it's not an apples-to-apples apples comparison, but I can look at parts of Noah's life and glean some wisdom from his life to apply to my own. And the reason why Noah is so encouraging is that when we think about Noah, we're reminded that nothing is too hard for God. Noah experienced God's blessing on his life time and time again. Noah went from faithfully leading his family to being the patriarch to a line of descendants, as it tells us down in verse 12, that would be as innumerable as the stars in the sky or the sand of the sea for multitude. So when you, we think about Noah, if you're like me, you think, I want to be like that guy. That's who I want to follow. That's who I want to learn from. That's whose feet I want to sit at and learn from. I want to be like him. What can I learn from him so that God can look down and say, man, this world is crazy. People have lost their ever-loving minds, but Garrett's doing okay. That's what I want. What can we learn from Noah so that we can please God? Where it can be said about us, hope found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Gary found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Janet found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the middle of a world that has lost its way, God can look down and point at us by name and say, they're getting it. I've got some people in the middle of a wild world that I can find grace in. What can we learn from Noah? We're going to see three things in verse 7 that we can learn from Noah's faith that we can try to learn to have a life and a faith that also pleases God. Now, if you'll remember, the three aspects that we're really trying to hone in on and understand as we go through this chapter are those three words, information. What does the text say? Second word is explanation. What does the text mean? And thirdly is application. What does the text mean for me? What can, how can I apply this to my own life? And the title of this series is entitled Faith Does. And today, the, the message title, when we consider what it is that faith does, is faith moves us to action. Faith moves us to action. We're going to look at three things today that the Bible points out about faith as demonstrated in the life of Noah and how we can relate to that. The first thing I'd like us to see is that faith moves us to obey. The beginning of verse 7 says this, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen as yet, what's the very next word? Moved. 
We see these two words at the beginning of the verse once again where it says, by faith. By faith, something happened. By faith, something occurred. There was a result that took place because of faith, and what happened was movement. Now, once again, we see that faith is not lifeless, it is lively. Faith is not idle, it is active. Faith is not motionless, it is moving, and it involves movement. We see here that faith moved Noah to do something. We saw last week in verse 6 that faith moves God. Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 tells us that faith moves mountains. And here we see in our text that faith moves us. When we look at this verse, we see that Noah's faith moved him to action. And specifically, we see that it moved him to obey God. Genuine, authentic faith moves us to action for God and moves us to obedience of God. Let me say that again. Genuine, real, biblical, authentic faith moves us to action for God and moves us to obedience of God. So when we look at this verse and we try to apply it, we have to ask ourselves and say, okay, the Bible says that faith should be moved me to be actively following God but I'm not. Spiritually, I'm at a standstill. I'm not moving forward. The Bible says that faith moves to obedience, but I'm not really obeying some basic commands that I know that God has given me. Whether it's not being as loving or as forgiving as I should be, whether it's not sharing the gospel the way I should, maybe it's not serving God the way I should, there's something missing, and I want to know why. I want to know what I can do to strengthen my faith. I want my faith to be more alive and active. How do I get there? If that's where you are, that's okay. In fact, it's great if you're humble enough and real enough with yourself to admit that as of now you have faith, but it's not active. The faith that you have isn't moving you the way that it should. That's okay. Remember, the apostles told, asked Jesus in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, they said, Lord, increase our faith. And God didn't reprimand them. He didn't chastise them for, for asking that. God didn't ridicule them. The father in Mark chapter 9, who had a son that was possessed with an evil spirit, he came to Jesus and he, he begged Jesus to heal his son. If you remember, Jesus said, all things are possible to him that believeth. And that father said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Please get this. This is, this is so important. It's okay to be honest and tell God, my faith isn't moving me to be as active and as obedient as I should be. Lord, would you increase my faith? God, I believe I do, but my faith isn't complete. It's not whole. God, would you help my unbelief? I do believe, I do have faith, but I want more, and I see from your word that you want me to have more. If that's where you are today, that's not just okay, that's great. Because no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how mature you may be in the Lord, you should always want your faith to grow. We should always have a desire for our faith to improve and increase. And guess what? The good news is your faith can increase. It doesn't have to remain static. It doesn't have to remain stationary. Your faith can increase. Your faith can grow. Your faith can move. How? Romans ten seventeen says, faith cometh by hearing in hearing the word of God. You know how Noah developed a faith that moved him to action? You know how Noah developed a faith that moved him to obey? Look what happened earlier in the verse. Noah heard from God. Noah heard from God. If you want your faith to grow, guess what? You have to put yourself in a position to hear from God. Now God speaks to us 
differently than how he spoke to Noah. All throughout the book of Genesis, we see the phrases, God spoke to Noah, or the Lord said unto Noah, repeated over and over and over again. So God was verbally and audibly communicating and speaking with Noah. But just because God doesn't speak to us the same way doesn't mean that he doesn't speak to us at all. He speaks to us through his word. God's word is alive. God's word is active. But only when we're in, when we're in position to hear it. Only when we're in correct fellowship and relationship with him. God still speaks, and he speaks powerfully and personally through his word. If you want your faith to increase, if you want to have faith that moves you the way that it moved Noah, faith still comes the same way to you as it came to Noah, by hearing from God. Read God's word. Memorize God's word. Meditate on God's word intentionally choose to place yourself in places where God's word is being taught and discussed and guess what your faith will grow your faith will come that movement towards obedience will come as you choose to make these changes in your life so we see first that Noah had faith that moved him to action and, and you can too but there's something else that Noah had that you have to have in order for your faith to become alive, active, and obedient. As verse 7 continues, we see another important word. It says that by faith, Noah was moved, but notice that he was moved by something very specific. It says that he was moved by fear. So if you're following along on your, on your outline, that brings us to our second point of what faith does. Faith moves us to action, but faith moves us to obey. And now we see that faith also moves us to fear God. Now the pulpit commentary is a commentary that I reference pretty often in my sermon preparation time. And it defines and refers to fear this way. This type of fear mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 is godly fear. It is a special and reverential respect of God and his character. And here's the key part. It is a type of honor and respect reserved only for God. It's an honor and respect reserved only <coughs> for God. Now why is that important? How does that apply to us? This idea here about godly fear. Well, in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right. And here we see that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of growing in active faith. So not only can our faith grow, our wisdom can grow as we hold God and his word in the highest regards possible. That godly fear that holy reverence, that respect for God and his word that is unrivaled in our lives. The respect and honor and love that we show to God that is unparalleled, that we don't give to anybody else or anything else. That's the type of fear we're talking about. You can leave today with a plan to increase your faith, with a plan to improve your faith. How? You've got to fear God. We he see here in verse 7, the faith moves us to fear God. And this is where we find out who really wants their faith to change. This is where we find out who really wants their faith to grow. This is where we find out who really wants their faith to increase. Because listen to me, this is, this, is, this is a true statement here. Everybody wants to hear from God. Almost nobody wants to fear God. Everybody wants to hear God. Nobody wants to fear him. All of us would love for God to speak to us in the way that he did to Noah. And tell us exactly what he wants us to do. All of us would love that direct line of communication where God would just speak to us audibly 
and tell us what his plans are and what he wants us to prepare for and get ready for. But we see the act of faith, faith that moves us, involves not only hearing God, but active faith, faith that moves us, involves fearing God. And the reason why so many Christians never actually live out an active, biblical, growing faith is because of this reason. They don't fear God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 24, it says this. The Lord commanded us to fear the Lord our God for our good always. The Bible says there is something you can do that is for your own benefit. There is something you are commanded to do for your own advantage. There's something you are commanded to do for your own interest. There's something you are commanded to do for your own blessing. It is to fear the Lord your God always. Now be honest. Have you always feared God the way you should as a Christian? I'll be honest. I haven't. I haven't. There have been times in my life where I've given lip service to the Lord. There have been times in my life where I've gone through the motions spiritually. There have been times in, the, in, in, in my life where I've read my Bible daily, prayed daily, gone to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, not because I was doing that out of godly fear, because I was doing that as part of my religious routine. It's just part of the schedule. It's just like breakfast or lunch. It's something I did on certain days of the week. Have you always feared God the way that you should as a Christian? Now think about this. This is what's really important for today. Are you fearing God right now? the way you should? Do you honor, respect, and revere God in your life right now in this very moment the way his word tells us that we're all to? Recognizing that the standard given, the commandment given by God in his word is for his people to always fear him. See, the problem is we get too comfortable with God. We get too casual with God. And that leads to us getting too complacent with God. Now listen to me, I'm not talking about some legalistic rituals or some man-made traditions. I'm talking about honoring God, fearing God the way that he says we ought to. Let me point out just a few ways that God's word says that we ought to honor him, fear him, and respond to him. If you want to write these references down for later on, I'll go through them really quickly. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. God says, this is your entire job. Fear me. Keep my commandments. That is your entire purpose. That is to be your sole focus. That is to be your complete reason for living. That is the whole duty of man. Fear me and keep my commandments. How are you living up to that? Psalm 33, 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Psalm 34, 9 says, Fear the Lord, ye saints. God says, this fearing business, this honor, this respect, this isn't just for unsaved people, this is for saved people. This is for redeemed people. It's not just for sinners, it's for saints. Then the book of Proverbs, the very first chapter, down in verse 7, God's word says, the fear of the Lord is a beginning of knowledge. God says, you know what, this, this fearing me, it's literally the first step. It's basic. 
in our modern vernacular or lingo, we refer to that as common sense. God says, look, there's some things that you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out. There are some things you don't need to be academically or intellectually gifted to figure out. And fearing me is one of those things. You just need some spiritual common sense. God's word says, fear God. That's the whole duty of man. That's all you got to do. God says, it's common sense. Fear me for your own good. Honor me, and I'll bless you. Respect me, revere me, I'll bless you and lift you up. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26, it says, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Psalm 34, 9, O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. God says, when you fear me, I'll give you confidence. I'll give you provision. I'll give you protection. Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. God says, you're out there trying to find the keys to a happy life. Trying to find the keys to a blessed life. God said, I'll give you that. I'll give you a life beyond your wildest imaginations. I'll give you a life more abundantly than he speaks of in the, in the book of John. But you got to fear me first. You got to honor me first. Now, I say all that to say this. All those verses about fearing God, all those references about God blessing those who fear him, it comes down to this when we look back at verse 7. A person who is not moving is not demonstrating faith. A person who is not obeying God is not demonstrating faith. Why? Because a person with an inactive, disobedient type of faith doesn't fear God. And a person who doesn't fear God doesn't demonstrate or live by faith. Here's how this applies to your life. Here's how it applies to my life. If your faith doesn't move you to do something, if your faith doesn't move you to do something, you are either unsaved or you're living like you are. Either you don't have faith or you're living like you don't. Either way, if your faith isn't moving, if it isn't active, go back to verse 6, you're not pleasing God. Look back at verse 6. It is impossible to please God without faith. And we see here in verse 7 that faith moves us to action. If you are in the same place spiritually right now that you've been in for months, years, decades, or maybe even since you got saved, let me say something very clearly, very directly, so you don't get it confused. God is not pleased with that. He doesn't care if you're in church on a Sunday morning. If all you've ever done is walk in and out of a church building, you've never been active outside this building, God is not pleased with that. If you know all the hymns, you can sing them by heart without opening up the book, but you're not fearing God, not obeying, him, not obeying God, guess what? He doesn't, give a, he doesn't give a hoot about how many verses you have memorized of come thou fount. He doesn't care if you sing amazing grace at the, the top of your lungs. If you're not fearing God and living by faith, he says, it's impossible to please me. Sing whatever song you want. Memorize any verse you want. Learn any instrument you want. Until you fear me, till you obey me, you will never please me. That's the God we serve. And that's the faith he commands us to have. In one way that we see in our life, if we have real faith, is that faith does not sit still. It takes no faith at all to sit still. It doesn't take any faith at all to stand pat. It doesn't require any faith to stay put. It takes faith 
to move in faith by its very definition will not allow you to stay in your current condition. Faith, as we've seen by its very nature, involves action and produces action. Faith, real faith, not fake faith, not this malaise faith, real faith moves us. And if your faith doesn't move you, your faith isn't real. That's not me saying it. That's God saying it through the life of Noah and all the other people that we're going to talk about in this chapter. Faith moves us. And one way it moves us is it moves us to fear God. We see in verse 7 that Noah was moved with fear. So if you're thinking, man, I've been saved for a while. I've been coming to church for a while. But my faith is pretty much where it's always been. I'm not really growing in my faith. I'm not really sharing my faith. I'm not actively serving God in any ways. What is the issue? The issue is, and this is not me saying, this is God's word saying, the issue is you don't fear God. And if you do, you don't fear him enough. What we see here in verse 7 is that faith will move you, but guess what? Fear will move you too. Neither faith nor godly fear will allow you to remain where you are. If you have the type of faith that we've been studying about throughout the past seven weeks in this series, without question, you will be moved to action because that's what faith does. And if you have the fear of the Lord, the way that God's word says that you should, without question, you will be moved to action. Simply put, when we look at verse 7, we can summarize what we've covered so far this way. God says, God says, show me a person who isn't growing and constantly active in serving the Lord. Show me a person who isn't obeying the Lord. Show me a person who lives however they want to live without any consideration or fear of the Lord. And God's word says, I'll show you a person who doesn't really have faith. I'll show you a person that I'm not pleased with, regardless of what other little spiritual checkboxes they check off throughout their lives. Faith moves us to action. We've seen the faith moves us to obey God, and the faith moves us to fear God. I'd like to close by looking at one other action that faith moves us towards. Faith moves us to prepare. Dad, if you could go down and get the children to come upstairs and sit in the front row. Now the children are going to be kind of walking in and out here in just a minute to come up the front row for an illustration at the end. But if you can, as best you can, just try to stay focused on, on what we're discussing right now. Faith moves us to prepare. As verse 7 continues, it says, Noah, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Faith moves us to prepare. You know the story about Noah. God told Noah that he was going to destroy the world. He said, look, Noah, this world is a mess. The people have fallen into all sorts of sin and debauchery and wickedness. And then back in Genesis chapter 6, it says that it repented God that he had made men on the earth. It says it grieved God's heart that he had made men. But then in verse 8, it says this. God, God said, look, these people are a mess. All they've done is caused me grief and pain. I'm going to wipe them all out and start all over again. But it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let me ask you something, and, and think about this honestly. Think about this seriously. If God was displeased, dissatisfied, and disappointed in what folks were up to in Noah's day, how do you think he feels about what's going on down here now? Amen. If it repented God that he had made men back in Genesis, if God was sorry and regretted making men back then, if what was going on in earth then grieved God, how do you think he feels now? 
Well, we know how God felt back then. God said, I'm going to wipe the whole lot out. I'm going to blot them all out. Then in Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, God said, I will destroy man whom I have created from off the face of the earth. L let me tell you something, and, and if, it, if, this, if the shoe fits, so to speak, wear it. I'm not going to stay here long, but let me tell you something in this. One thing we see from Noah that we can apply to our lives, God doesn't play around with sin. And guess what else? God doesn't play around with a lack of faith. Romans chapter 14, verse 23 says that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And guess what? God won't tolerate it. God didn't put up with sin in Noah's day, and he isn't going to tolerate and put up with it now. Let me say that again. God didn't put up or tolerate sin in Noah's day, and he's not going to put up and tolerate with it now. And there needs to be some people like Noah, who when God looks at the rest of the world and found only grief, he needs some men. He needs some women. He needs some boys and girls who find grace in his sight, not grief. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 tells us, commands us, says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. But how many people, I wonder, does God just shake his head with disbelief? Shake his head with displeasure, dissatisfaction, disgust because of the lack of their faith. In a world that was given to sin, in a world that had turned completely away from their creator, in a world that had turned their back and walked away from the God who made them and loved them, the world needed a Noah. In the day in which we are living, where good is called evil, where sin is not only tolerated and accepted, but promoted and celebrated. We need some people who can find grace and favor in God's sight. Why? Catch this, don't miss this. Why do we need to be people who find grace in God's sight? because God didn't call an unsaved man to build the ark. God didn't use a backslidden Christian to build the ark. God didn't use a man with dead faith to build the ark. He used a man of active, obedient faith to prepare the ark. When we continue to see what faith does, when we look back to the beginning of verse 7, we see those words, by faith, Noah was moved to action. And specifically, we see that he was moved to prepare. Now, this is where I want to bring our thoughts as we prepare to close. If I could have all the children that are up here now, just come stand up here and spread out here, up, up here on the stage where everybody can see you on the screen. Look back at verse 7. What was it that faith moved Noah to prepare for? Look what it says. The saving of his house. Now, I want to ask you to do something I don't normally to do. I don't normally have the children up here with me. But if you're here today and you have children, if you have grandchildren that are in your care, I want you to just do something real quick. If you're saved as an adult and you put your faith, you put your trust in the Lord, and you have children that God has blessed you with and entrusted to your care, would you just stand up for a minute really quickly? Now, let, let me say something. Let, let me preface this. I, I'm glad that we have... Sunday school class, right? Praise God for hopping Sunday, right? I'm glad we have 
junior church class that is going on that we brought up right now. I'm glad we have Awana clubs on Wednesday night. I'm glad we have missions and memorization classes for kids on Sunday night. But do you know who has the primary responsibility to make sure your kids get saved? You do. I'm thankful for Sunday school teachers. I'm thankful for all the women who dedicate themselves to serving in our children's ministry. But guess what? They're not the ones God has entrusted your children with. They're not the one that God has entrusted my children's hearts and souls with. If you have children, understand this. God gave them to you. It is your responsibility to see that these kids get saved. You need to be prepared for your responsibility. Don't get me wrong. God has called me to preach the gospel, and I'll do that as long as he allows me to. But children shouldn't be hearing God's word. Children from Christian homes shouldn't only hear about the Lord when they're at church. Children, you guys can go back down and sit down. If you want to join your parents, you must sit back on the front row. Thank you for coming up. You guys can take a seat too. Here's how this all ties together. If you are an adult that has been given the amazing blessing and responsibility by the Lord to raise up children for his glory and for his honor, to nurture them in the admonition of the Lord, if your faith doesn't move you, if your faith doesn't move you to obey God, if your faith doesn't move you to fear God, guess what? They won't either. If your faith doesn't move you to walk with the Lord, these kids won't walk with the Lord either. If you don't fear God, they won't fear God. If you don't obey God, they won't obey God. It's a tremendous responsibility that God has given us. If your faith doesn't move you to obey God, if your faith doesn't move you to obey God, your kids won't either. If your faith isn't active, if you're not obeying God and fearing God, here's the thing. You're not even prepared to save your own family. We talked earlier about how fearing God is for our own good. But guess what? It's not just for, it's not just for our own good. It's for their good, too. It's for their benefit. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, God says, you've got two choices. He says, there's life and there's death. There's blessing and there's cursing. And God implores his people. He begs his people. He says, choose life. Why? That both thou and thy seed may live. God didn't tell Noah to build an ark just to deliver himself. God told Noah to, Noah to build an ark because there are a lot of other lives that were depending on being saved by his faith, by his preparation. Maybe you can live the way you are right now and be okay, but how about your kids? Maybe you can live with your own stagnant level of faith, but how about those other family members that God has placed in your life for you to reach them? Some of you might know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Where you got saved, but your faith was never really active. Never really moved you. You just kind of went through those motions like I talked about earlier. Your faith wasn't active. You didn't really obey God. You didn't really fear God. You never really served God. You did things and made choices that you knew were wrong, but you didn't really fear God enough to live for him instead of for yourself, and now your kids aren't walking the Lord. You have grandkids that aren't saved. Family has no spiritual interest in things. Why? Because you didn't live out your faith. Because you didn't fear God the way you should have. Because you didn't obey God the way you should have. Listen, that ark wasn't just for Noah. He would have been, been finding a one-person canoe. But God didn't tell Noah to go build a canoe. He didn't tell Noah to build a kayak. He told him, he did not tell him to build a rowboat. He told him to build an ark because God's purpose for Noah was to be prepared to save more than just himself. And that's his purpose for you. That's his purpose for me. God forbid 
if the people God entrusted us to reach for him die and go to hell or get saved but never live for the Lord because the people he called to reach them weren't prepared by the way they lived out their own faith. The people he called to reach them weren't obeying or fearing God themselves. God forbid if children grow up in our homes and don't get saved because mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, weren't prepared to save them. Because mom and dad and grandpa and grandma's faith never moved themselves to action. Your faith is not just about you. It's about living a life of faith that prepares others to get saved. We've seen today when we consider what faith does, that faith moves us to action. Faith moves us to obedience. It moves us to fear God. It moves us to prepare. Where are you on those steps? Apathetic, indifferent faith doesn't lead anybody else to salvation because it's not prepared to do that. You know what apathetic faith does? Goes through the routine. Walks in and out of church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Reads their Bibles, prays, focuses on themselves, but never prepares to lead anybody else to the Lord. Active faith, real faith, authentic, genuine faith, prepares for and provides and produces more people getting saved, more people walking and living by faith because it's been moved to action. It's been moved to obey God. It's been moved to fear God. It's been moved to prepare for other people to be saved. So as we close, let me ask you today, where, where's your faith? Do we want to talk about Noah or do we want to live like Noah? Do we want to just recognize Noah as being a great man or do we want to start living like Noah? Where is your faith? What impact is it having for the Lord? What impact is it having on you? And what impact is it having on these ones that we're supposed to be prepared to reach for the Lord? If we can have every head bowed and every eye closed, Miss Janet comes forward and prepares a, prepares to say, play something.